Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, this year, to celebrate Pride, we wanted to create uh, spaces to have some really meaningful dialogue about our identities. And uh, we're so excited that BGN, Black Googlers Networks, and Googlers partnered up to bring Duray McKesson for you today. Um, <laughs> I'm going to read Duray's bio. Uh, Duray is a protester, and he's dedicated to ending police and state violence, notably through Campaign Zero, and as a civil rights activist, both at the local and the national level. He previously worked at the Harlem Children's Zone and TNTP, opened an academic enrichment center in West Baltimore, and with Baltimore City Public Schools and Minneapolis Public Schools, is leading systemic human capital change. He was recently named as one of the 50 world's greatest leaders by Fortune Magazine, and as one of the 30 most influential people on the internet by Time Magazine. Please help me welcome Dre McKesson. It's an honor to be here. It's good to, to see some familiar faces and, and so many new faces. Um, this is embarrassing for you, Ben, but I went to college with Ben. I saw Ben in the hallway. I was like, oh my God, I'm like, oh, I haven't seen Ben in forever. So most people know that I wear this belt every day, but I also wear my Bowdoin. I mean, most people know I wear this vest every day, but I wear a Bowdoin belt every single day, um, which you don't see. And, and Ben and I went to Bowdoin. So if you don't know Ben, you should meet him afterwards because he's great. So I know we're going to do a moderated conversation. I'm most excited about these questions, which I've not heard, and also your questions, which um, are going to be probably the freshest things. I worry sometimes that I tweet so much and I talk so much <laughs> that you probably heard everything I could possibly say. So your questions make me most excited. But I will say on August 16, 2014, I was sitting on my couch in Minneapolis. I was a senior director of Human Capital. And I was looking on Twitter to see what was happening in Ferguson. And I was looking at TV to see what was happening in Ferguson. And they were not the same stories. And I was like, I want to go see for myself. And I just wanted to go bear witness. So I got in the car. I drove nine hours to St. Louis. I put on Facebook that I am going to St. Louis. I didn't know anybody in the state of Missouri. I wanted to find somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody whose couch I could sleep on. Seven hours in, I get a call in uh, Iowa, I, I, in some rough roads in Iowa. Uh, <laughs> I got a call. And you know, it's, it was uh, Google Maps. If you work on the Google Maps team, Google Maps almost got me in Iowa, <laughs> let me tell you. Because there was like no reception. So I like took this call and then it was like my GPS was like, ah. so it was a lot of faith in Iowa. But I got a call and they were like, Dre, we found somewhere for you to sleep. And, and that was my story. So I showed up in the middle of the street in St. Louis, like so many other people in those early days, you know, Mike got killed on the 9th. I was there on the 16th. The second day that I was in St. Louis was the first day of the um, curfew. If any of you remember the curfew back in those early days. And it was also the first night that I got tear gassed. And it was in that moment that I said, I will do whatever I can to make sure that this is not a world that other people have to experience like this. Before that, my work was all about kids. I was a teacher. I opened up after school programs. I was a number two in human capital in Baltimore City Public Schools in Minneapolis. But I had this moment that was like, you got to be alive to learn, right? That I'm doing all this work to make sure kids have like a great teacher every single day. And Tamir will never know a high school teacher. Mike Brown will never know a college professor, Ayana, Rakia, so many people, and that changed the world for me. <clears throat> One of the things I worry about when I think about the last 20-ish months, um, I worry that people think of protesters or protests as only those of us who stood in streets, only those of us who put our bodies on the line uh, in that way. But what I know to be true today is that protest at its root is this idea of telling the truth in public, that we stood in streets to tell the truth with our bodies, that Mike should be alive and Rakia should be alive and, and Ayana, that we disrupted board meetings and commissions to tell the truth, that they should be using their power in ways that benefited the lives of black people and other marginalized people. And in that sense, there are many ways for all of us to tell the truth in this work, that you are not uh, absolved from your commitment to social justice just because you have not been in streets, but we all have a role to play. And that has to be how we think about what comes next in the movement space. Um, I'm excited to talk about the questions. I do have many worries about where we go next, uh, but I'm hopeful because I know that so many people over the last 20 months have done so much to make this a nationwide conversation, that we are talking about race and justice and identity in ways that we have never talked about in public in our generation, and that is really powerful. Uh, and there's a real onus on all of us to make sure that we turn this into more than a moment, that this is not just a really cool conversation we've been having for the last 20 months, but that we actually change the world in some demonstrable ways. And I think that that part of the work is a little potentially less sexy uh, than the beginning part of the work for some people.
but that work is really important that if all we do is change the conversation, we have not done enough. But changing the conversation is unbelievably hard work. And I say that as somebody who, you know, we were in the street for 300 plus days. I'm just one of many people who did that across the country. And it has been powerful to see people own their voices in new and incredible ways every <clears throat> single day. And I bless you. And I do think that the conversation about identity is something that we didn't, we didn't know was going to happen in those early days. Like we just had no clue. But it's been powerful to see. I remember the first time in St. Louis that there was ever a conversation about sexuality. There was a protest. So the police killed Mike, and then they killed 10 people after Mike Brown in St. Louis. So it was like just continuous trauma. And they killed Von Derrick and Shaw, which is in St. Louis City. And I'll never forget, it was like the police had circled in this intersection and they were it was like they were like pepper spraying people it was a mess and this guy walks up to the police and he's like you fucking faggots that's like what he yells at the police then he turns around this other protester looks at him and it's like chaos right the whole nice chaos and this guy looks at him he was like that really offended me and the guy's like i'm sorry and i was like wow look at that <laughs> <laughs> and it was in that moment that i was like i think we'll be all right like i think that we will figure this out and that we will continue to push the boundaries of what people have thought community look like um, and that moment is something I refer to often because I will never, I was like, and when he said, he was like, you're offended me. I was like, oh, this is about to be bad. Yeah. <laughs> and then he was like, I'm sorry. And I was like, yes. So, <laughs> you know, I think about those small moments often because I think that they have larger implications about how we build community, how we come together, what that means, uh, and how we learn to love each other differently. So excited to be here. That was just the beginning. I'm excited for Rebecca. She's been a great uh, wrangler of me over the last couple of weeks. <laughs> And I'm most excited for your questions. Thank you so much, y'all. So I want to start the conversation on the point that you made about our different identities or our identity categories. Um, at the GLAD Gala, you, you, you had a quote that is so beautiful. It says, um, there, is beautiful, there is beautiful complexity in our identities and that there is danger in the either or. Can you touch a little bit, I know you talked about it now, but can you touch on intersectionality and why it's so important that we continue to have these conversations and actually drive them with action? Yeah, so, you know, we show up as, I was somewhere recently and somebody said, Dorea, are you like black first or gay first? And I was <laughs> like, well, uh, you know. Um, and in the end, what I said was that you, you see my blackness first before you see anything else, but I like live in all of my identities at the same time every moment, right? And part of our work is how do we make sure that people are safe living in their identities at every moment, whether you see it or not, right? And just because you don't know doesn't mean I'm hiding. Just because you don't know I'm gay doesn't mean I'm not gay. And it also doesn't mean that I need to tell you every two seconds about it. But it is about how do we make sure we do our part to make sure that people are safe in every part of the world they live in. The thing about the either or uh, was not necessarily about identity as much as it was, I think, in some of these spaces where we are so passionate about the work, like it become, we like take these camps, right? We're like either reformists or revolutionaries. We either like live in community or we don't live in. Like it becomes so in, like the camps become so intense, um, and people I think don't often do the work of saying like here's how we can actually do both at the same time. So you think about Congress, the sit-in that Congress just did, and you know I have my concerns with it, but overall I support it, <clears throat> and people are. You know, it's like this either or. Either you like hate the no-fly list and you hate everything, or you know, it's like people aren't allowing for people to say like, I believe in the sit-in that they did, and I think the no-fly list is a bad thing. I think those are both real. People are sort of camped out where like either you like hate John Lewis and the other congressmen, um, or you completely support the no-fly list, right? Like, and I think that that isn't a fair way to think about the world, and I think that. The way we show up in the world is much more complex than this either or. And the both and takes a little more work uh, to think through, but I think that's like the most honest way to be in the world. Cool. I know we were talking a little bit before on, on your talk about the quiet. So Dre had a, um, a comment that says, I wasn't in the quiet, I, was in, I wasn't in the closet, I was in the quiet. The quiet is a place where you're not supposed to make noise. Can you tell us more about the quiet and anything, like the pressures that you might have felt or that we feel about staying in the quiet? Yeah, I got worried about people talking. Like, I don't think I was in the closet. I just think I wasn't talking about being gay, which wasn't me, like, hiding. The closet, to me, is this idea that, like, I'm hiding and, like, I don't want people to know and I'm putting something away. And, and that wasn't how I thought about myself, but I didn't have, like, the language to think about it differently. So I was like, you know, I think I'm in the quiet, right? Like, just because you didn't know doesn't mean I wasn't, doesn't mean that I was hiding. And it was like this image of the library is a place where like people are supposed to be quiet because quiet keeps you 
quiet is like how you learn, right? Quiet is like the best way to access information. It is what keeps you safe in a, in a certain sense. Um, but what we know about libraries is that people whisper all the time. And it is that collective whisper that actually makes uh, noise. Um, and it is the whispers that I think we need to honor in many ways. I think the movement was a lot of whispers, right? It was people all across the country, definitely all across St. Louis, saying, we think something is wrong. We don't know what to do. And we don't know who believes with us, but we think something is up. Um, in the, or the corollary I see between sort of identity and the movement was, was all these people coming together sort of saying, I, I think we want to talk about something. Like, it's a, little, it's a little quiet right here, but let us come together and like make a louder noise. Um, and when I think about identity, there is something about I do think a lot of people are in the quiet, and then our part as organizers is like, how do we help people feel comfortable uh, like moving out of that quiet space and not shaming people for being in the quiet, but taking it as our responsibility that some people feel like that is the only way they can be safe, or that is the, the most honest way that they can be who they are and also be safe. I remember you know, growing up in Baltimore and people, like I remember the sting of being called a faggot. Like I remember that as a kid. And there are some places as a kid that I made a choice whether I was going to you know, talk about identity a certain way because I just didn't want to be traumatized like that anymore. Right? And how do we build a world where people can be who they are and the way they want to be that is safe like every time? You think about that when you think about the bathrooms, right? Like when I was on the breakfast club with Charlemagne and Charlemagne has said some problematic things about a whole host of issues, but we talked about the bathroom bill in the trans community. And I'm like, Charlemagne, what do you do in the bathroom, right? Like, what are you doing in the bathroom? <laughs> when I go to the bathroom, I'm like going in, going to the bathroom, coming out. I'm not having a party. I'm not passing out like business cards, right? Like, what is, you know, people should be able to say, like, what you do in the bathroom, people should be able to say doing that, right? And he's like, I mean, I guess Duran. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know. So, how do we help people complicate the way, um, we think about identity and especially complicate the way we think about what safety means. Is there an added stigma to being queer in black and brown communities? You know, I, I worry about, in my head, I think about this in the same way that I think about black on black violence. Like, I don't want to like stigmatize blackness as being like more homophobic than anything else. I am black and there are definitely a lot of black homophobic people. That is real. Um, I would like to believe, or I believe that there are like the same number of homophobic people in all communities. I have a different proximity to black homophobic people because, you know, I grew up around black people. But so I do think there is something about the way that masculinity functions, especially in marginalized communities, is a signifier of power when you don't have power. Like when you are, you know, what it means to be marginalized is that you are like on the margins, right? And on the margins, you are unseen, you are um, unseen and unheard. And I think that there are moments when you can perform a certain way to be heard and seen in a way that's acceptable. And I think masculinity functions like that, that people can perform a way to sort of mask some of the things that they struggle with about being marginalized in general. Uh, and I think that that encourages like a very subtle, though still insidious form of homophobia. Uh, that is, I think, particular because of its manifestations in marginalized communities, but not unique in impact. When you talk about like on these margins, what are the people who are marginalized and from different angles because of their identity? What are some of the needs that someone at these intersections has? You know, I think about the intersectionality. You know, uh, I've started to talk about my worries more publicly just because you know I, I want everybody to like push forward. But what I worry about with intersectionality is that people really only care about their intersection, right? Mm -hmm. That people are like, <laughs> intersectionality, but here's where I stand. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think at, at the simplest level, it's just this understanding that we have complex identities and we are all of them at the same time and that we need to, again, build a world where people get to do that. Um, and it is true that people should be able to speak for their own and they should be able to talk about their experience in a way that is authentic so, to help people understand. I'm an ally to the trans community. I, there's so many things that I need to learn and I'm not the best spokesman. I definitely try to be the best ally that I can be, which means that I have to listen more than I talk, right? Um, and I think that is a, a key part of what it means to stand at the intersection, especially intersections that are not ones you claim. Uh, but it is also about making sure that you actually believe in everybody's intersections and not just your own. And I, and I think that as the conversation has become more and more public, that people really are camping out in the spaces that they feel the most comfortable. Uh, and I get it in the sense that like, I try to be a really good ally. I think I have a big platform. I want to push these messages. I have to own though that like, there are so many identities that I don't know intimately, right? That I'm still learning and growing. Uh, and we have to like continue that mindset as we push forward in the work, because I think that is like the most honest. I think that's the most impactful and the most true. Awesome. I want to shift gears a little bit. 
you, you know, you, you talked about how you got involved with the Black Lives Matter movement, but I want to hear more about the great work that you're doing with Campaign Zero, and if you could just give us some background on how that got started. So when I think, with, when I think about the movement, I think about four phases. The first was like the first nine months we were helping people understand that there was a crisis across the country. So if you remember like August 2014, people were like St. Louis is screwed up, Ferguson screwed up. People were not like America has a problem. They were like St. Louis, <laughs> the police in St. Louis are crazy and the police in St. Louis are definitely crazy. So that was true. <laughs> um, but it was not only the police in St. Louis. So it took us, it took until the death of Sandra Bland, Walter Scott, Freddie Gray for people to be like, okay, I think there's like a crisis across the country. And it's like, okay. Uh, and the second phase of the work, I think, is about helping people understand and appreciate that there are real solutions out there. And that's where Campaign Zero came in. So Campaign Zero is modeled on this idea that we can live in a world where there are zero deaths by police. You know, in 2016 alone, there have been nearly three people killed by the police every day. In 2015, the police killed somebody every day but 18 days in all states. Right? And like we just didn't know. I didn't know that was happening before Mike Brown got killed. Um, and we wanted to, to think about what are the real policy solutions that we can put forward to structurally end police violence. We believe that we can change structures and systems in ways that change culture. That is like a core belief. So it's everything from the things you've heard about, so like body cameras, independent investigators, to some stuff that we did for the first time. So we created the first public database of police union contracts. Some Googlers helped us out with that. We created the first public database of use of force policies around the country. And what we've come to believe is that the police are actually hiding in plain sight. So the Freddie Gray verdict came down today. Uh, he, uh, This officer was acquitted. And what I said to the newspaper is like, this is disappointing, but it is not surprising given that we have like a shadow justice system for the police that will protect their behaviors at all costs. And what we're saying is that the, the things that actually protect the police are, are public documents. So you look at the police union contracts, I mean, in cities across the country, police can only be interrogated for 30 minutes, hour chunks, and then they get an illegally obligated bathroom break, phone calls, meals, you know, like stuff that private citizens like never get. Um, or you look at some of the more insidious things. So you, there are clauses around the country that'll say like the police chief is the final arbiter of discipline, which most people are like, that makes sense because it's the police chief, right? So like, you're like, that's a harmless clause. It is that clause that prevents civilian oversight boards from having any power, right? And the police have just been amazing negotiators in cities across the country, just make it, putting this language like so deeply embedded that looks innocuous but has huge consequences on how we hold people accountable. So we've been trying to lift that work up um, and expose that. And then the use of force policies, it's like, you know, in cities across the country, it is still okay to hogtie people. Like Baltimore, you can still hogtie and chokehold people. It's not against policy. It's not against the law. It is totally acceptable. Um, and that's wild to us, right? Like we don't think that makes sense. So we would say the stuff that we're pushing for is like not very controversial. We think this is really common sense. The police have done an incredible job of making it of systematizing it. So you think about a place like LA, the protections for the police union contractor in the charter of the city itself. So undoing it becomes this crazy organizing battle. Um, and there is some disagreement about some stuff about uh, Campaign Zero, right? So we come out in support of body cameras. There are a lot of organizers around the country who don't believe in body cameras for, for reasons that make complete sense. Uh, this idea that if you believe in community policing, which is this notion uh, that the police should like be in community, right? We think that that is a really race-based way of thinking about the police. That if you put police in the Upper West Side and like they were high-fiving white kids, they got off the bus and you know as kids were playing basketball, people would lose their minds. But in black communities, it's like the police should just be everywhere, right? They should be like there when you get off the bus. They should be at the corner. So we worry about that with community policing. But if you believe in community policing and body cameras, you might create like a second surveillance state, right? Like if the police are ever present, they have cameras on them. They could amass this wild batch of footage that can be used against people for a host of things, especially because for most crimes, like the statute of limitations is pretty long, right? So you like, I don't know, hit somebody on the cheek, three months later, you're arrested for assault, you know, like, and we've seen the police, even in St. Louis, do things like that. Like they'll take footage of somebody throwing something four weeks later, they arrest you, right? And like, so we worry about those things. We believe, though, that there are structures that you can put in place to hold people accountable. The White House, Megan, who's a, the chief technology officer in the country, they're doing some really interesting things uh, around body cameras. One of them is looking at the audio to see if we can use the audio as a predictor of aggression 
uh, in officers to identify officers who are more likely to abuse people before there's actually trauma. Right now, the video is all post-trauma, right? It's like you kill somebody, we look, at the, we look at the video. But could we use the audio in a way that's really interesting? And there's another partner with the White House that's looking at, can we create a program to trigger the parts of the video that a human eye should look at and then delete everything else so that the government is just not amassing footage on people, which we think is like an interesting thing too. Um, so we love Campaign Zero, met with Obama about it, um, and Valerie Jarrett and, and Bernie and, and Hillary and Loretta Lynch to talk about like how we actually make these things real. Uh, the reality though is that most of the changes happen at the local level. At the federal level, you know, we're working with the domestic, uh, Cecilia who runs the Domestic Policy Council around the FBI. Like an FBI, if an FBI agent kills you today, you're screwed, um, not only because you'll be dead, but because uh, <laughs> there is almost no way that any activist can hold them accountable. Like we just don't, they don't release the names. There's nothing, we don't, we don't know anything about them. And what people often don't realize is if you know, if you've heard any number about the police, about police killings at all, it is all from newspaper clippings. Like that is the source of truth. Like that is the most robust data set we have. And we think that we've actually been underreporting. that if you get killed in America and our newspaper does not pick it up, you are not in the data set. Like you literally are, you don't exist. And that is wild. And that has huge consequences for how we think about demographic data. So you, there's some places in Texas where the data looks like white people are ki being killed disproportionately. We think that they are Latino, but they're being miscoded because it's newspaper clippings. Um, so we are working with people to do some back end cleansing, but that's even like the Washington Post database, the Guardian's database, like all of it is newspaper clippings. Like if you kill in America, it's not picked up by a newspaper, you are not in the data set. And that is wild. You brought up a point about, you know, we think about cops hanging out playing basketball in neighborhoods. If that is not what's providing safety, then how can we change the conversation about what safety really means? Yeah, and, and I'm not against cops potentially playing basketball. You know, <laughs> right. uh, but there is a, there's a notion of policing that is like they should be ever present. And then basketball becomes like a proxy for the ever presence, right? Yeah. It doesn't become like a way to build community or a way as a part of like a larger strategy about government sort of in community building, it's like, well, the police should be here anyway. They should just pick up a vest. You're like, okay. Um, I think that what's real is that we know that the safety of our communities is not predicated on the presence of police, right? That if I ask you where you feel the most safe, it's probably not in a room full of police. It's probably in a room where there's like family, where there's friends, where people love you, where there's food and shelter. Like that's what safety means. And then the question for us becomes, how do you scale that for people? How do you make that something that everybody can be a part of? When we think about the police, people often think about them in three buckets. The first is the um, the first is crime prevention, and crime prevention really isn't police work, right? That's like schools, families, jobs. The second is about the response to crime, and the response to crime is um, is more of police work. But we know that one in four people killed by the police are people who have mental health trauma, and the response to all trauma can't be somebody with a gun. So you think about, you know, I've talked to people who called for help when their firm might threaten to commit suicide. And like somebody with a gun isn't probably the best responder in that situation. So we have to start thinking about how do we not have a police first response to all trauma. And then the third bucket is around solving crime. And that really is, that is more police work than not police work. But that can't happen when there's not trust and accountability. And the trust and accountability doesn't come when the police are, get off on every single thing that they do, right? Uh, that's why people won't call. That's why people uh, don't give them tips, right? Like that doesn't work when you're like, well, they're gonna beat up my cousin or they beat up somebody I know, like that doesn't, that doesn't work. So at Google, we love data and measuring success with numbers. You're tackling issues that are so just large and important. How are you, when you go home, you're like, how do you measure whether or not you're successful, your campaigns are successful? And, and is, is there an end point? At what point do we say, you know, check, like we did our job? Yeah, so I'm mindful uh, about a couple things. One is that the movement is young, that we won't undo 400 years of oppression in 400 days, right? That like that is not real. Um, I'm also mindful that so much of this is about lifting uh, data sets and stories and putting, making them as public as possible. So at Campaign Zero, we have like, these huge data sets and we're about to launch like a new way to look at police union contracts that is a little easier for people. And we're about to launch a new project around use of force policies and laws. Uh, and we've been working with a lot of people in tech, a lot of Googlers have been a part of our uh, Slack group about like, how do we actually just make this simpler for people to, uh, for people to like access and understand because we believe that the truth is so damning that it should radicalize people. 
but we have to like get the truth to people. Like, how do we do that? In terms of what success looks like, I think that one real part of it is is changing the conversation, which I think we did and continue to do. And then the next part is like, how do we continue to organize and build uh, power and coalitions as we move forward? I believe two things. One is that there are more people that want to do good work than know what to do. And there are more people that want to do good work than want to be members. Like, I think we're in this, this unique moment where people have this uh, aversion to membership. Like, they want to do good work. If you told them, like, do these new things, they're like, yes. If you said, like, will you be a member of this? They're like, yeah, no. Um, and uh, which doesn't mean there's not a role for membership-based organizations. I think there is. I think there will always be. I think there's also a, a challenge and a role for organizers to think about how to mobilize and activate people who with whom you share the same values and beliefs but don't want to be members. My belief about that, my hypothesis, is that there is a generation of us who grew up being members of everything, right? You remember this. And that, and that like, still, that still, you still carry a little bit of that around, so you're a little gunshot. Um, or you just don't want to sit in the basement of a whatever every Wednesday, right? That just isn't how you think about being in the world today. But if somebody said, will you do these three things, you would totally do them. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how to continue to mobilize people around those sort of issues. And we don't care if you're a member or not, as long as you do the work. And how do we do that? And how do we demystify organizing? I think that there's some people who have like organized for 30 years and da da da. And I say that as, you know, you know, I grew up in Baltimore as an organizer in 99 when I was a teenager. So like I'm one of the people who organized before. But I do think that there are people in the movement space that sort of make organizing out to be this like mythical thing, right? That like you got to call the ancestors and get a you know get a conversation with them. You got to read fifteen books. And I think organizing at its root is this idea of like I believe the world can be better. Here's how. Let me find other people who believe that with me. Like that is what organizing is. That's how it starts. Um, and that's how I think about measuring it now. I think that at some point we will need to be honest about whether police violence is is decreasing or not, right? So once we actually institutionalize change, if there's no change in the outcomes, then we haven't done it right. And I think the third phase of the work is about institutionalizing change. So we change the conversation, we help people believe in solutions, we institutionalize the change, and the fourth bucket is around protecting the change once we make it. So you think about the Voting Rights Act as a great example of the protect phase wasn't done well, right? That like the rollbacks happened in a, in a really intense way. They got incredible, um, traction with the Voting Rights Act, and now it's been repealed a little bit. So how do we put these changes in and then actually make sure that they are livable things that we see the fruit of? So I want to change topics a little bit. Um, there, was, there was a really interesting article that came out last year on Those People magazine entitled, um, Dear Black Men, You Are Not Pro-Black If You Are Not Pro-Black Women. Do you see this? Like, is that something that it's present? Like, do you see it, the erasure of women in black and brown communities? And how can we address that? Yeah, and I think erasure often manifests in two ways. One is that either our stories are never told or they're told by everybody but us. Um, and what's been powerful about this moment is that like we all, everybody gets to be a storyteller. So I think about so many incredible women of color who are leading, who are organizing, who are telling their own stories and not waiting for, some, they don't have to wait for somebody else to tell their mm -hmm. story because there's not a barrier there in terms of who gets to be storytellers anymore. I think that's really powerful. I think that there is so much more work to be done around sexism and, um, in, in that space. And I do think that it is better and hard that we are having all these conversations in public. Uh, I think that people are like learning from these conversations about sexism and misogyny because they are they essentially get to participate as viewers first. And I think that that is easier for some people before they step in. I know a lot of people who are worried about sort of saying the wrong thing, but they they are like well intentioned, but the way they approach it, you're like that was not it. Um, <laughs> but because of social media, has really opened up space for them to like watch. They can participate by viewing first. And then they can sort of dive in. I think that's really powerful. But I do think the movement is important in the sense that there are men and women working together, women leading in new ways and being present and visible and not having to be in the background in the way that they might have been in the past. Um, and, and people um, of complex identities around sexuality like get to be present in a way uh, and be open about those identities in ways that they couldn't be before. Something that is personally really sad to me is um, we live in a country where one in five women will be sexually assaulted, and the average life expectancy of a black trans woman is 35 years. You've brought some really challenging things to light, and you've created a platform where we can you know, successfully highlight the way that our society has failed these communities. What advice can you give us um, to create platforms where we can continue to address the issues? 
Yeah, I think that's so, you know, I'm a, so I'm a Twitter evangelist. I love Twitter. Twitter's great. Twitter. Um, I know you work at Google. Twitter. Do you post on G Plus ever? Huh? Do you have a G Plus? <laughs> We gotta get you a G plus. I search all day long. <laughs> um, I say that because I I do think that storytelling is like one of our most powerful tools, um, and at the root of every story is an idea, and ideas matter because they inform the way we think about the world, and the way we think about the world is the way we act in the world. Um, and when I think about the trans community, when I think about sort of what is the next part of the work, it's like, how do we tell these complex stories in ways that are simpler for people and allow them to think about um, things they can do? So we are about to work on a project that is going to catalog all the laws that have been introduced uh, that are damaging to the trans community and put them in a really cool space and help people see so that we can tell the story about like the people we're fighting against are actually really organized, right? There's something common about all these pieces of legislation. And then here's actually how you can combat it. Like here are talking points. Like here's how we equip you in like a very visceral way with like things to do, right? And I think that's, uh, having been so close to the work over the last 20 months, I think that sometimes the people on the fringe, like the most insider of us, we start to think that everybody sort of thinks the way we do, or everybody sort of sees the world the way we do, or everybody, like, obviously they know that talking point, and they obviously know it's wrong. And I will never forget the first nine months of the movement where, like, there were black people who were like, I don't think the police are crazy. And we're like, the police literally just kill him. And they're like, but that wasn't my neighborhood. And you're like, what? Right? So, like, it took, it took us mobilizing our own community, like, a long time to, like, help people actually believe that this was, a, was close to them. And I think that with the work around identity, we can't take for granted that there are people who we love and who love us who still don't get it, mm. but want to. And then it's like, how do we like equip them to, to, to get it on their own and to get it with like more data and information? Um, and I think about some of the things about identity, we have it, there's just not a public space yet uh, to like learn the right things to say. Or like, I think about love is love as a great example. So when Orlando happened, people offered really interesting pushback on love is love. And what they were saying is that like, yes, love is love, but my identity, like my sexuality, is not just based on whether I'm in a relationship or not, right? Which I think is like an interesting way to think about it. And that language, like it's, I don't know, like I, I don't know if I would have been exposed to that if I just hadn't been on Twitter that day. Like how do we help people be in places or go places to like complicate the way they think about the world so they can like be better in the world? Because I think that is like, a, you're like, yes, love is love sort of reinforces this idea that like you are gay as long as you like, visibly love somebody else who is also same gender, right? Like, how do we say that that is a part of it, but that is not, I'm gay whether I'm, you know, single or not, right? And I think that, like, we have to do more of that storytelling work and be really intentional about it. Uh, and I think that sometimes we take for granted that part. We're like, we're just going to put the data out and we're going to do the that. And we miss the, like, simple truths that people can repeat over and over. And, like, love is love is a great simple truth, right? It's, like, simple repeat it over and over. It's like, how do we complicate those and how do we create new ones that people can do uh, that really push the work, you know? I feel like sometimes I could physically see people getting uncomfortable when we talk about race. Like, why are we so uncomfortable having these conversations? I think some of it is uh, there's still a lot of trauma and, and people like haven't dealt with their own trauma, which is no indictment of them because like you shouldn't be trauma. You shouldn't, you shouldn't live in a world where you were traumatized. Um, some of it, too, is that there are a lot of people who are afraid of the outcome, right? They think that there's going to be a lot of loss that comes. Uh, so you think about the privileging of whiteness. I know there, there, I know white people who totally get white privilege, who are like, it is bad and don't want it to end, right? Like, they, they want to dismantle white privilege, but can't imagine a world without it. And, like, I think that is real. And it's like, how do we have public conversation about what that looks like? Like, you have to, you will not have the privilege once it's gone, right? Like, that is a, a condition of the end of white privilege. And I think there are people who, who like, conceptually don't get that yet. They're like, yeah, that's bad. And you're like, you're not going to have it. And they're like, no. And you're like, no. Um, so how do, we, how do we talk about that? And then I think that there is a real thing. You know, I've come to understand that my role is not always to be the person giving lectures to people about, like ending racism, right? That some of this work is about asking, uh, being the person sitting with people, asking them the question that if I'm trying to get you to change your mind and I know you approach it from a problematic space, like me lecturing you for 20 minutes, like probably isn't going to do that. But if I say to you, like, should Freddie Gray be dead? And we start from there in like a real honest space. And then you say something and I respond, like that actually is like probably better at converting you than me being like, I can't believe you think that Freddie Gray killed himself and then six people watched him, you know, 
you enter the conversation not believing that, right? So me like yelling at you about it isn't going to do that. And I think that there's something that we do as marginalized people who live this every day that we hear people say problematic things and we're like, which makes sense to me because it is emotional and real. I think that in terms of converting people, sometimes our approach can be like the really thoughtful, incisive question that like puts the onus back on them, right? That like they actually have to do the work because sometimes we get so riled up doing all the work, we're, we're over processing things and they walk away still believing the same thing, totally chill. <laughs> You're worked up. You're, you're, you need a nap. You're like, I'm done. It. Um, and they actually haven't thought anything differently. And I think that that's real. And also, we white people have to figure out how to organize white people and challenge white people. So think about there are white people who are going to say and do things about race around each other that they would never do around me, which is probably better for both of us. Uh, but it is about how do we get white people in those spaces to hold other white people accountable and to really push them to think about uh, the stories that they allow other people to tell the truths that they allow other people to disseminate over and over, and then how they use their resources and skills and abilities uh, in this work. You know, I've met a lot of people, um, and we rarely if ever ask people for money, and we've met like a lot of really interesting people. Uh, we always ask people for their time and talent, uh, because that is a conversation about resources, right? If I'm in a room with a billionaire, like, I don't need a gazillion. If money alone could fix it, like, we would have fixed it. I need to figure out, like, how we can use your time and talent to, like, create new something, right? And if you, you know, um, who can I pick on that won't be, uh, whatever. So I think about like, there's some people, it's like, skip the street. We don't need you in the street. Don't come to the street. But you calling the governor means something very different than me calling the governor, right? And how do we like, be really clear with people about how you use your access and privilege and ways that like change people's lives for the better? So with that point, there's people here that have incredible skills and have a lot of access and we have a lot of privilege. How did we identify what to do with that access and to really drive like social and economic change? I think that, so there are a couple things. One is you can join people who have already made a commitment to doing the work, right? Um, I'm sensitive though that like you also, you, you probably have an idea of like that cool thing that should exist, that you're like, I think it exists, but I don't want to create it because it might exist. Like most of us have those ideas when we think about this work and like you can actually start that right now. Um, and you don't need permission to do it. You don't need like a huge platform to do it. I think about some of the cool, Sam who built Mapping Police Violence, which is like uh, one of the projects in Campaign Zero. Sam like lived in San Francisco. He randomly tweeted me, tweeted me one day. He was like, Dray, I want to do something. I DM'd him back my phone number. We had a good call. He like made this website. We pushed it out to everybody and it was like a thing, you know? And now Sam's a part of our team. But he was somebody who was like, I think we should map police violence in a different way. And it was like, build it. And like, we'll totally help people see it. I think there are a lot of, I think that that, you know, there's this myth that people like have to join these existing structures and da 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 da. And like, if you want to, you should, right? Because there are a lot of great organizations out there. Uh, but I think about the movement as a space that there was no organization that got us together in Ferguson, right? This infrastructure emerged. And there's a difference between organizing organizations and infrastructure. The infrastructure was there. I was a tweeter. There were people who were live streamers. There was a bail fund. Like, we all worked together and there was like some, some sort of unwritten rules about how we'd interact, but there was no like organization that we had to join to be in the movement space. Um, and I think that now people sort of feel like they got to join something to be a part of it, but like you probably already know that really cool thing that you should exist. Uh, I think about somebody used Twilio last week to make a phone number that people dialed it. Like you dial the phone number, you put in your zip code and it automatically called your two senators and representative around gun control, right? Really simple, took, it would have taken me like 10 years to make, took this guy like, you know, 10 seconds. Uh, he made it, he had no platform. We found out about it because we know some people at Twilio. We blasted it out to like all these people uh, and like Russell Simmons, he put it in his networks and you know, we pushed it out really wide and far. And like he just made it on his own time, right? Like I, you know, I don't know him, but we totally made that thing like a, a bigger thing than it was on its own. Um, and he didn't need to join anybody. He just like thought it was the right thing to do. And, we, and now we like love Twilio. We're like Twilio everything. Right? <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so if you if you want to do some of the stuff we're doing, like we have a Slack group of just tech people um, and people who are committed to sort of building new platforms uh, that help people think about the problem differently and most importantly think about the solutions differently. Because I worry in the movement space that it's easier to talk about the problems than it is the solutions, right? That like there's this addiction to being like the world is bad and it's like, got it, got it, got it, right? And it's like, what do we do? People are like, I don't know. You're like, well, <laughs> that's not helpful. Um, so we'd much rather like at least keep failing around the solutions and only talking about the problems. Um, and there's an easy way to, to be a part of our team, but 
again, you can be a part of, you being in the work will make you better at this. And I, I know a lot of people in the tech community specifically who have joined and been in spaces and they are, they might be quiet in them, but they go home and they're like, oh my God, I heard the person say that. We should totally think about this. And it's like, yes, right? Like that's often how this work starts. And I worry sometimes that there's this myth that like, I don't know, again, you get this phone call from the ancestors. It's like, please do this today. <laughs> and that like, is it, that's not what happens. So what about hashtag activism? Is it better that we're talking about the problem? You say we like to talk about problem, not solution. Is hashtag activism helping, or is it just like procrastinating people actually making a change? Yeah, I think that I'll never criticize people for telling the truth. And I think that truth telling is such a hard thing, especially for people of color and marginalized people. And if Twitter is like the space that you tell the truth, then like I'm all about it. That like truth telling is such. Uh, such a has been such a difficult thing has been a thing that this country has prohibited black people from organizing around and doing it that like i will always honor the fact that people use digital spaces to tell the truth that is real um, and knowing that that is again not always the end of the work right that that is often the beginning of the work but that has a role to play and if it were not for twitter in St. Louis in August of 2014, Missouri would have convinced you that we didn't exist. You know, they literally would have been like, those people aren't there. And it was like, <laughs> that is crazy. So when you think about Baltimore, what makes Baltimore stand out is not only the circumstances of Freddie's death and sort of Baltimore's proximity to D.C. and all this other stuff. It is that it was the first big city in protest that you saw aerial footage of because you didn't see any of that in St. Louis because they put a no-fly zone on like August 11th, right? They got the game down. So if it wasn't for social media, like literally you wouldn't have seen us. And I even, where I get frustrated now talking about the protests because people think that we like marched in solidarity with the 60s and we were like marching because that was what we thought protest was. It was illegal to stand still in August of 2014 in St. Louis, right? Like we, we marched because we, we literally could not stand still. It was called the five second rule. And it was like, you can't stand still and you can't pace and you can't return to the same spot. So like you couldn't like walk down there and then come back to this spot. It was like wild, you know? And that was the world we lived in. And you didn't necessarily see all of that like on TV and stuff because they had put such an effective blackout on the media. Um, but again, the fact that you saw anything was because we had social media. And I'll never, um, I'll never criticize social media for that. I do think that like this has to be a combination of the online and offline, that that has to be real. It is always funny to me that the people that people take to Twitter to talk about how much Twitter doesn't matter, right? <laughs> and you're like, well, if it didn't matter, why are you posting it, right? Um, but yeah, no, so I, I think that most of the critiques that people offer about social media are disingenuous, or it's people who loved it when they had a big platform, and now that people aren't listening to them, they're like, oh my God, Twitter's awful. And you're like, meh. Well, I'd love to open up the floor. If anyone has questions, we have a mic over here. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I have a question as like a black straight male, like how you said about white people should organize other white people about issues. How can I organize other uh, black males? Because there was like an issue at our school where like some people, like some of the black males consider themselves like woke, were unaware of like the sexism and homophobia they projected on like the people they try to fight for. They still would say some of the very sexist things like behind like in our group meetings and stuff like that. So how can I have a where I can have like an open conversation with them to tell them like I'm aware of like their microaggression stuff like they have because some of them are just like I can't be sexy homophobic like, I, or like they think they don't have like certain privileges because they don't think like what's happening in America with them as a black male like they don't think they have any privileges as being a straight male in America. So yeah. how can I have the open discussion or activities to make them aware of these certain things and make them more inclusive of the other people we're supposed to represent and help out? I, that's real. I, you know, I'm mindful that we aren't born woke. Something wakes us up. And there's like a real difference between being woke and staying woke. Yeah. And like, I think about, um, I think about myself. There are people who are like, I like you, DeRay, and they hate gay people, right? But they're yeah. like, I like you. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. That one. Um, a couple of things. One is that this work is often slow for people to like own their growth areas around these sort of deep things, right? Um, I also think that some of the most effective ways to change like individual people's hearts and minds is, is like in private sometimes. Uh, and then using examples that are not necessarily about them, but like that they don't realize are about them, but that are about them. So I think about people who like say some really problematic stuff. And if I said to them, you just said that thing uh, that is really crazy, then we'd be fighting for the next whatever. But if I said to them, I can't believe that person said that which is really what they just said, right? <laughs> and then we talk, use that as like a launching pad and then sort of at the end get back to like, you said that too and that was really problematic, right? Like, I, I think that people need to process this stuff. Um, 
and I and I say that because I, I've seen people try and beat people over the head about it. Like you're homophobic and da da. Which I think like there's a place for sometimes, right? Because some people just say wild things, and you gotta check it real quick. But there are some people who are trying, um, but like need a different space to try. And I think that like I know a lot of straight men who are really transphobic and don't know that. Like yeah. they they think they like are standing in solidarity with the trans community, but are super problematic. Um, and it's like, how do we actually have those like conversations with people, like in really honest, like closed spaces that like allow them to grow? I think it's right. I think about my conversation with Charlemagne. Charlemagne says some really problematic things about the trans community. But if I had gone in being like, you know, you said this, da, da, like I don't think we would have had a productive conversation as opposed to like Charlemagne, let's just talk about this a little bit. And he moved much further than he had before publicly and when we talked afterwards. And like I think that that has to be some of how we do it. Um, but it is important to to have people see that they have done some of this stuff too, right? That you said faggot and that was really, I, me and Azalea Banks had that back and forth on Twitter um, about her saying faggot, right? And she was like, da 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 She texted me being like, da 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 And then like last week, she's like, I will never say faggot again. And it's like, oh, okay, thanks. Right? <laughs> hey, this progress. took a long time coming. Um, but it was about like, how do I say like, that is just problematic, right? And we can talk about it, but I want to say to you publicly, like this is not okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Arnie. I identify as transgender and have done like a training se training sessions here at Google called Trans at Google. And some of it's definitely like dumbed down. Like it's kind of a 101, right? Yeah. And there's a really interesting conversation happening within the trans Google community about, you know, how much of this is our responsibility, like our responsibility and why, you know, why are we having to justify our existence? And, I, and I'm kind of of the mind, like, well, there are people out there who aren't malicious, and, like, we need allies. Like, that's important. But I think a part of me is, like, oh, is this just, like, internalized transphobia, that that's the reason I'm out here, like, justifying my identity? And so I guess I was wondering what your thoughts are, and I think that's a debate in a lot of different places. Yeah, that's a... That's real. It's a real question. I think about like there are a lot of black people who are like it's not my work to teach white people about blackness, right? They like go read. There are a lot of there are a lot of things out there. I think the reality is that it is not everybody's work, right? That there's some people who are like this is not how I plan to show up. This is not what I think it means to organize, and that is real. And like we should honor that. Like you, we shouldn't force people to like teach people other things. The other thing though is that that is how some people think about their work, and that is also real. And we should like allow them to do that. And I would rather me like help you think through something than you like read some crazy thing from some crazy person and then you think that that is the truth and then we're fighting, right? And then you like say some, uh, so I am one of the people like you who's like, I think that we can talk about it. I don't think that it is internalized anything, but I do think that we uh, have to always be mindful of like our motivations in it. That there's some people who are teaching because they want the validation from that crowd, right? There's some people who are teaching to like answer questions and and to be somebody who like helps people like think about a different experience. And I'm somebody who like still is learning about the trans community, for instance, right? And if people wouldn't talk to me about their experience, like I wouldn't know. And I and I would think I'm like a really good ally. And then I say something crazy, and I'm like, well, I tried to ask, but people, you know. So like, you know, I'm in that space of like, I need, like, we're, how do we help people? Um, like understand this work a little better. And that doesn't actually always mean that it has to be like a person, right? There are some amazing texts and things like that out there. But I do think that it is some people's real work to like help other people think about the world a little deeper, but it's not everybody's. So I think that, again, it's like this either or. It's either like nobody's work or it's everybody's is how people often paint it. As opposed to saying like, it might not be yours, but it might be mine, right? Which I think is like probably a little more honest and real. Uh, while we make sure that the people who think that this is their work, like always check their motivations for being in the work. You mentioned, you know, you're a big fan of Twitter and Twitter has been a great platform for a lot of people uh, to sort of be able to have conversations that they couldn't have before. At the same time, like Twitter has also uh, come up in various contexts and like it has an interaction uh, method that often enables harassment and abuse. And so I'm, I'm wondering about your thoughts on sort of not navigating the line between both opening up conversations, but also opening up vulnerable populations uh, in interactions. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, you know, I blocked 19,000 people personally on Twitter, so I completely <laughs> get the like. <laughs> uh, and like individually, you individually, have to block all of them? One at a time. Oh my God. And, uh, <laughs> I get the, you know, I got, 
I screened, I did a screening of the Panthers documentary in Baltimore at this independent, uh, at the Charles, this independent movie theater. And people tweeted in death threats. The police came. They shut down the movie theater. So I get it, right? Like, I get the rest in peace. And my Twitter account got hacked the other day. My phone's got hacked the other day. Somebody called Verizon um, impersonating me, like, got my SIM, the SIM number chain. So my phone was, like, bricked for a little bit. And then they used two-factor to hack, in, hack into my Gmail and, um, <laughs> and my Twitter account. So, like, I get the rest in peace. There are a couple things. One is I think that uh, Twitter just recently changed the blocking feature. They didn't do, I don't, you know, I know that people at Twitter well. Uh, I don't always know, like, why they make the decisions they do. Like, they didn't, there's no blog post about this change in blocking, but I think it is, like, a real change. So when you block people now, they are, like, very blocked. Whereas before, if you, if somebody blocked you or you blocked them, there were, like, these workarounds that you could still interact with them, essentially. And now that is gone, and I think that's, like, a real thing. The thing that people um, <clears throat> talk about the most is, like, the uh, the sheer volume, right? So you'll get people who, like, flood you. If somebody targets you on Twitter, and then all of a sudden, like, 100 people are tweeting you, it's a pretty not fun experience, right? I don't know what the quick solution is for that. Like, I don't know. As somebody who gets it, like, I'll get people who will put, um, like, you know, when that when I got hacked, somebody, like, spoofed these, like, fake DMs about me and Netta, and they put them all over the internet. So, like, for two days, it's like, my mentions were, like, just people upset about that because the, the DMs are, like, you want to put martial law in the country or whatever. So, literally, it's, like, hundreds of, like, why do you want martial law? And I'm, like, get these out of here, right? I don't know what Twitter would have done. Like, I just don't, I don't know what the solution looks like in that space. Um, I do think Twitter is really slow around the harassment stuff, right? So you, uh, you submit a thing saying you've been harassed or whatever, and then it's like 10 hours later, and I, they got to figure that out, right? There's a volume issue that I think is tough for them because people abuse the report function too. Like, people will mass report somebody they hate as like being hacked, and then they'll freeze their account. Um, and they need to figure that part out. Like, I, I think that they have not figured out the speed part. And, I, and when my Twitter account got hacked, it took me a while to get back in, and I, like, know them, right? Um, and the speed piece, I think, is, like, what I actually, which is what I worry about more than anything else. I do think it's unique in the sense that it's, like, the most open platform, right? Facebook is your friends. So when they see something crazy, it's, you know, like, unfriend them or something. And maybe block them or report them, but it's different. Twitter is, like, standing on the corner, and, like, it's, like, the world is right there, Right. And there's this question of like, do you put up these cones so the world can't see you, right? Which fundamentally changes what it means to stand on the corner. Or do you make sure that people like can't run you over, right? It's like, what is, what are the two pendulum swings? And I think that Twitter is like still finding its space. But I do think it doesn't get credit for uh, how hard it is to keep the commitment it has uh, while making sure that the platform is safe. I do think that they've been really slow on usernames so, though. Right? You shouldn't be able to have a name that's like, I hate the n-word right like that doesn't make sense to me and they have been slow on there i i think that and i have no insider knowledge about this but i think that uh, they also have not moved away from the rat race around users right they're in this like user race with facebook and i think that twitter's real story is about impact and they have not figured out a metric around impact yet and if they did i think that they would win like they'd win that fight but they are still fighting people around this like user thing and you think about yesterday with the sit-in it's like when when paul ryan cut off c-span it was Periscope, right? Like that was it. It was an it was an immediate like this is an impact thing, and they are still fighting people on this like user thing that I think is a loss. I think they will not win the user fight. Thanks. So uh, my question is about something you were talking about earlier, um, calling out comments that that people make. Uh, this is something I you know I really want to do more, and I think I'm kind of getting better and better at, at doing it. Um, I think it's it's a lot easier though for me when it's in a context when. You know, I'm talking to another white person or there are only white people there. Where it's been a lot more difficult is there are people of color in the group who don't respond to the comment um, or even sometimes seem to agree with it. And I think where this has come up with for me in particular um, is with older gay men in the city, which a lot of people here will know that the, you know, the sort of gay community in San Francisco does tend to skew older. Um, and so, so I've come across older gay men of color who... Um, who don't seem to want to respond to these comments, and I don't know if it's because this is like a way of survival, you know, having been in this community for so long that they kind of, I don't know, I guess I'm wondering if, if you've noticed anything like that, um, if you have any advice for 
how to address those situations. Yeah, sometimes it is real that people, sometimes people say stuff around me that like I should say something, but I'm like, I'm too tired today, right? Like we're, yeah. going, we're going to go back and forth and I just like can't do it today. I think about the woman, this woman worked on the Amtrak train and she said something crazy the other day and I just had to tweet like, I'm not going to let the devil get me because <laughs> So that is real. So some people are tired and that's real. I think uh, confrontation though, the world, so, the word sounds harsher than it is. I think there are ways to like, I think they're simple things. Like, what did you mean by that? Is like totally a way to like start a conversation with people that does, that gets you on the path of like either holding people accountable or like changing people's minds, but it's like a very simple entrance, right? And then I think with people that you have seen say like not address things that you think are sort of problematic, I think that there's a way to say like, I thought that was really troubling. Like, what did you think about that, right? As a way to sort of get to the why didn't you say anything so that you can like learn a little better. I do think that people, unfortunately start to think about confrontation is this like you need to have like a billboard that's like I can't believe you let your community down right which is like a not helpful way to think about this work but I think they're like simple ways to like create the entrance that then allow you to build um, which is like what made you say that like what did you mean by that is like uh, like I think those questions I've seen those be like super effective entry points and then you just need to be thoughtful about continuing that and that puts again the onus on the other person like you're not doing the work like they're doing the hardest work you're doing the work of asking the question um i love the policy proposals in the platform uh on campaign zero it looks amazing uh and i'm really interested in seeing how it can be you know brought on the local and state level and national level one thing i'm wondering about though particularly because in san francisco you know we've had uh, a huge increase in property crimes recently just there have been like two stabbings within a block of my apartment. And I know that the constituency, like in my neighborhood, which is the Castro, which is generally whiter, wealthier, even if gay, would have like their instinct would be to demand even more uh, kind of enforcement of these like loitering laws yeah. and like in those kind of things. And then at the same time, I see from my parents living in. New Orleans, who, which has also been going through a crime wave, their instinct is to have more police that are like more intervent, intervening more. So I guess what I want to know is, from your perspective, when you're having conversations with people whose instinct is like driven by fear, and who look to the police as like a way of address assuaging that fear, and you want to say to them, "Hey, no, this is like a longer term solution, and we need to like actually get here so that there everyone feels safe." Like how do you how do you approach that and what works? People's like proclivity to call for the police makes total sense to me, right? In a, in a world where we have made people believe that police equals safety, like I get it, yeah. uh, whether I agree with it or not. I think that when we think about community violence, like when we, if you think about the legal economy, there's a way to deal with conflict. If I don't like you, I like call your boss. I file a lawsuit. I like file a complaint. There's like a whole apparatus. In the illegal economy, there's only one way to deal with conflict, and there's violence, right? So if we don't, if we, if the solution to like community violence, all that stuff is not about getting people out of the illegal economy, I think we will always spin our wheels. Like any solution that isn't about like, uh, like jobs, education, housing, like those are like the actual solutions that will change the needle. In the absence of those, the police, I think is like, will always be people's like best solution. So when you think about like Baltimore, 40% of the adults can't functionally read. It's a crisis, right? So you, we could bring every industry we want in America to Baltimore. People can't read. Not gonna matter, right? It's just gonna it's gonna matter significantly less. People are gonna wake up being like, "I need money. How do I get it?" And if that is selling drugs or doing whatever, like they're gonna people are gonna like get their needs met. And again, like I think that too often, I think that the the work around getting people out of the illegal economy is like the not sexy, super dull but like the work that actually changes people's lives. You think about the homeless populations, it's like we know that it is better for homeless people to be in homes than not, which sounds really simple, but there are people who will see a homeless person and will take them to drug treatment first, right? And we actually know the outcomes, if you do that, are worse than if, if you actually just put the person in a home, right? Like that, and it's called like the housing first strategy, that people like need homes before they need anything else. Um, but it's easier to be like, we're going to put you in drug treatment for today. And then like, you actually like, didn't solve any of the problems. So I don't know like a great response to people who call the police like that. Cause I get it. Like it may, I get why older people do it specifically. Like my grandmother being one of them. 
But I also believe that like the way to get out of that is to really think about community violence in a completely different way that is like very structural, very like not sexy. It's about jobs, literacy, like access, those sort of things, transportation, you know. I know people in Baltimore who can only work in parts of the city because that's where the buses go, right? So like they physically cannot get to another part of town in less than three hours and they're not gonna get a job. Like they just won't, they're not gonna make that choice, right? Which severely limits the opportunities they have, you know, which is like a crazy thing that's real though. My question is, well, first of all, we know change is not happening fast enough. Um, and you were talking about sort of the stages of organizing and how only the third one, the third step is being able to see outcomes. And that's obviously not fast enough because um, people's lives are on the line. Um, and I'm just curious about how you personally stay patient and how you stay sane um, and how you bear witness and organize around all these things when you put so much effort in and things are still so very slow. Yeah. So I know I'm not alone and that's important to me, right? That I'm like one of many people who are doing this work. Um, I have great friends, which is helpful. And uh, I was a teacher, you know, I used to teach sixth grade math and I feel a responsibility to make sure that those kids like live in a world that is not the world I grew up in. And like that keeps me hopeful. You know, I'm like, I got it, we can do it. and. You know, all across the country, I've seen people like find their voices and like step up in ways that like give me incredible, like if I had not been in Ferguson, I think I would not be an organizer in this way right now. But I saw like all these people who never ever would be together, like doctors, lawyers, unemployed people, cause driver, like every, we were all like one community in a way that like all those other labels didn't matter. Like we were people with shared values and like that really changed me. And like that gives me this immense hope. And again, it is, I believe two things. Like there are more people that want to do good work than know what to do and more people that want to do good work than want to be members. And for me, there's this huge challenge of how do we, how do we like organize those people? And I think we can do it. I think tech will be a part of how we do it. I think we've been trying to figure it out slowly, uh, partly because people have been dealing with the day-to-day -day trauma. So they haven't pulled back to think about sort of macro spaces, but uh, that keeps me really hopeful. Thank you. And um, along with Andy and many, many other medical students who are part of this an organization called White Coach for Black Lives, and it sort of focuses on um, bringing attention to structural racism and gun violence and other issues that are public health issues but historically haven't been thought of as so. And my question is, I've, throughout my you know year and a half or so being involved with this, I've come across many people who whose hearts and minds are already one, but because of the structure, because of things they have on the line or because of things they don't have on the line, they don't feel sort of motivated to uh, either affect change or to join the movement. And so I, I guess my question is, how do you uh, get people to sort of contribute more uh, once you've already convinced them of, of what you're doing? Good question. I, I met with the people who uh, run Doctors for America, and like I think that they're doing great work. I think y'all are doing great work. With the healthcare thing, I, I think some of it is messaging too. Like I think we should talk about healthcare uh, or health beyond hospitals, right? Like I think that's like a simpler way to think about it. That the health health is about so much more than like when you go to the doctor. That health is like a broader thing, and then we need to have public conversation. Doctors need to lead that conversation. So that's like one piece. Uh, the what you do after you win hearts and minds. Hearts and minds is harder win. So that's like you pat yourself in the back for two seconds, <laughs> and then uh, I think it's about being as explicit as possible about what the ask is, right? Because I think that sometimes we, we, we figure out we got this community where like people care and then we're like, go do the work. And people are like, well, what does that mean? And they're like, the work. And you're like, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> and I think that that actually doesn't help. I think that's how we lose people really quickly is that they feel like it's like a lot of hot air when in reality, I think that like the, the making the choice around what, it, what the discrete thing to do is actually really hard and organizers always feel really pained because there's all like there's a million things that people should do so saying to people like here are the three things we want you to do right now is something i've seen even the most incredible organizers like really shy away from because they they're like nervous that they're like forgetting something and that but i think that that is actually what keeps people they just like when i was a teacher you know kids want to feel success right they want to walk into a building and like feel successful every day and so do adults. Like adults want to feel like the thing that they've devoted their time to is like a part of a success story. A success story. And some of that we have to like, we have to be manufacturing in the sense that we have to be really thoughtful about it. So like when I gave the first test in, when I taught first test, every kid was going to pass it. Not because it was not, I wasn't giving them the answers, but it was like just hard enough. But we would do enough prep right before that I knew that like 
you would you had to sleep through the test to fail it, right? Like everyone was going to pass the first test. Second test, super hard, right? It was like the, all this content that I needed them to like really, really grasp. But I needed to set up a system where like they felt successful when the challenges came. And I think that in organizing work, like we have to make sure that people can like experience like success early, or they know that they've experienced success, and then we we offer things that like they can actually do. So even when it might be a loss, like they, the success is like, it's a new community and it's a new da da da, that we are always thinking about how we make people feel like they're doing something. Because you know, as well as I know, there are a million things that are competing with your time, right? You could be watching Game of Thrones, great last episode. Um, or you could be organizing, right? And like, you want people to choose the thing that you're doing, but I do think it's about how you really discreet with like what the ask is. Thanks. I was interested in you were talking about the issues with homelessness and earlier about the issues dealing with like the police um, contracts. And I found in a lot of cases, like it looks like theoretically there's a program to help someone, but when you really dig into it, there's like so much paperwork and so much like unsexy barriers. Like, what can we do as advocates to try to get attention around those issues? And to deal with them, like, um, my uncle is pretty much non-functional, and it took six months of, like, constant work from multiple relatives just to get him, like, basic Medicaid, and they still have to administer it. Like, there's no program to, like, actually give him the help he needs. Yeah, so I think about, I mean, I think this is where tech people come in, too, is, and this is why I think it's important that we do keep talking about the problems, but not only the problems, is that... I think there's some people who have incredible skill that can help us organize differently, like just don't know what parts of the world look like, right? Uh, and then it's like, how do we help people like be exposed to those experiences so they can do something? Like, there's this great Twilio. I know a lot about Twilio all of a sudden, but um, <laughs> these people have created this way. So food stamps go unclaimed in like communities all across the country. And one of the problems is people don't want to go sit at the Social Security bill and then like type in the thing, like who wants to do that all day? So they've created like a text-based way to figure out if you qualify for food stamps. So you like text this number, you fill out the whole questionnaire on text, it pops out at the end, like you do qualify or not. So by the time you get to the office, like you already know yes or no, right? Fascinating text solution, totally simple. I don't know anybody who knows a number, right? Um, but it is a great solution. And it's like, how do we have people build the solutions and then put them out there? I think about, I did a, when I was running for mayor in Baltimore, I did a, um, I did a visit to Meals on Wheels. Do you know the average age of a volunteer at Meals on Wheels in Central Maryland is 70? I was like, y'all, which is great for the 70 year olds. Y'all need a new strategy for volunteers. You know, like this is, and I will bet you that if people, that there are people who would totally deliver a meal every morning before going to work, they would do it, right? Like, but they need a different way of thinking about how people sign up and da da da. That like they clearly don't, they just don't get it, right? I think that there are people in marketing who would totally donate a couple hours to like help them come up with a different volunteer strategy. And it's like, how do we actually put those sort of like cases that are like relatively simple, but have a huge impact on people? Um, like, how do we create space where they, where people with skill, with different kinds of skills can like meet them? So that's, I don't have like a great answer, but I do think that like, uh, some of this is helping people think about the problems and being exposed to the problems. I think the solutions, there's enough good energy out there that can deal with them. And then we have to, there's a responsibility for people who have platforms to like really push them. Like, I'm all about this food stamp thing. I like saw it. I was like, everybody should, I mean, only if you need food stamps, but people should totally know this number because it does really good work. Um, it just isn't big. People don't know about it yet. Cool. Well, Zray, thank you so much thank for coming it. and educating and having this dialogue with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you.